wife's first husband. Oh, why didn't you die? <laughs> Here we go. Now that doesn't need to be on that. Whoever doing this would you get it a lot. It was May 29th, a beautiful Saturday afternoon. I was out on my back porch and looking off to the south, which looked like Route 13. I saw this dark black funnel, just like it was going straight down Route 13, headed toward Miriam. My 16 year old son had spent Friday night in Marion at a friend's house. So I got on the phone. It, was, it used to hang on the wall. Our phone hung on the wall and had a cord. And I called, and the friend's mother said, Brother Ralph, they decided to stay all night at my mom's house, who lived on Boulevard Street in Marion. And the report was that the tornado in 1982 that ended up taking 10 lives. One was a girl from Heron who just graduated the night before and was over at the Shawnee Apartments visiting her boyfriend. And, my, and this lady told me the kids, the boys, stayed all night at Grandma who lived on Boulevard Street right on the street were the Shawnee Apartments. So I got on the phone one more time and called the grandma and talked to my son and said, Dad, we're okay, we were in the basement. It went right in front. It was one of those that would destroy this home, but not that home, right next to it. And he said, Dad, I'm okay. I was not able to use my phone on that minute for the next three or four days because of the down phone lines. I believe God let that one phone call get through, May the 29th. May the 8th, 2009, I was sitting in our church auditorium being interviewed by a Southern Illinois news reporter. They were doing uh, uh, an article uh, and was uh, interviewing me. And we looked out, I believe it was on a Friday, and it got dark, and the trees was kissing the ground. The, they were just bending over. We got up, ran to the front, and we had one of these things, those uh, pavilion kind of thing like they got out in the field, and that thing just went flying off through there. Barbara said, our son was there, to pick up his son. I don't know what Travis is doing there, really. We went to the kitchen, and about that time, a tree came through the church roof. We went upstairs to get in the bathroom up in the front part. That was a derecho, or whatever they called it. May and storms have a connection in my life. So each May, I think about some of those storms. My mother lived through the 1925 Hearst DeSoto big, big one, really. But May made me think of storm. This morning, there were three, there's one storm that is recorded in three of the Gospels. And I want to look at that this morning and just think a few uh, a minutes. I tell you, like Kim Kardashian told her last husband, I won't keep you long. Uh, and uh, you can find it in Matthew 14, you can find it in John 6, but this morning we're going to look at Mark 6, starting at verse 45. How do you handle storms? Where do they come from? And how do you cope with the storms of life? And uh, we all want to have it. That's not the question how we deal with them. And uh, so let's look this morning. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus again, confessing that we're in this thing way over uh, our, our heads. And uh, we need the great teacher. We confess our dependency upon you. 
but at the same time of strong confidence in you that you said that you would teach us, you would guide us. That this morning you want us to hear from you more than we want to hear from you. So our confidence is in you. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Immediately, he made the disciple to get the boat and go before him to the other side. He made the disciples to get the boat. Why? Why did Jesus want them to constrain, compel? Now, he put the disciples in the boat. Now, you got to understand that. It wasn't that they did something wrong. They were doing something right. And he said, we're going to go to the other side. And then he dispersed the crowd. This crowd, he had just fed the 5,000. And this crowd came after him and wanted to make him king. Wanted to exalt him, wanted to follow him, wanted to make him king. And so he told the disciples, you get in that boat and we're going to go to the other side. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. Why? Why did Jesus go up to the mountain to pray? Maybe he needed a time to get with the Father and deal with the fame, the success. The crowd. Remember when the devil offered him all the kingdoms? He said, if you would bow, I give you all this worldly kingdom. Number one, I believe the devil could or it wouldn't have been a temptation. If the devil was not the prince of this era, remember we talked about that last, last week. Maybe Jesus wanted to get up alone and say, Father, help me as a man to resist success and fame. Sometimes succeeding can be the worst thing that can happen to you. How many couples ended up in a divorce and somehow said the best years of our life was when we had nothing? Those struggling years in the beginning. And then we got success and we got rich and we got okay and then we drifted apart. I, I, I don't know why he went up to pray but he went to pray. If Jesus needed quiet time with God, how much more do I need? When he chose the disciples, the Bible says he prayed all night. When the last time have something been so important to us that we prayed all night? Prayed an hour. Praying for an hour seems like a long time sometimes. If you, have, if you don't think so, you haven't done it. Praying for an hour, saw it. But he prayed all night. His power and his strength. He gave us this example. First Peter said, he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. He modeled for us how we, what we are to do in times of pressure, in times of needing strength, is prayer. He prayed. I don't think he went out there to cause a storm, but he went to pray. So now he had told them to you get in this boat and go to the other side. And when evening came, now the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against it. Now, this storm wasn't the kind that was going to destroy your boat. It's not the kind that I think these, these experienced fishermen was afraid of that they were going to drown. I don't think it was that kind of a storm. 
I think it was the kind of a storm that the Bible says was contrary wind. It was going against them. It was opposing them. It was the headwind. It's a kind of a storm that wears you out. It's a kind of a struggle that you've been in for such a long time. You're just sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're just exhausted. And it was that kind of a storm that will wear you out. It will keep you from getting to where you want to go. You'll seem like you have been struggling and you never quite can get peace. Never quite can get to where you want to go. It was that kind of a storm and opposing wind, contrary wind, going upstream. Ever felt like you just going up a one-way street and just struggling. It was that kind of a storm. For the wind was against him, but he saw it. He saw it. I don't care what you're going through this morning, you're never out of God's sight. He sees you. He sees the situation that you're in. You know, we quote that verse in Matthew that God sees every sparrow that falls. If you study those references uh, 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 closely, it's that God is with every sparrow that falls. That God knows about every little sparrow that falls. That it's in God's consent. It's in his will. Nothing happening in your life right now that God doesn't see and care about. He said, cast your burdens on him because he cares for you. You're never out of his sight. You're never out of his vision. You're, you're never so far that he does not know and what you're going through. And he was tempted in all points like we were. And I believe all points. I have teenagers ask me every week, do you believe Jesus was really tempted like we are tempted and you can take that and understand what they're talking about. And I said, yes. He said he was tempted in all points. He was tempted like all people. And he overcame so you can overcome. So we're never out of his sight. And he saw them. And he saw them were making headway painfully. Uh, they were uh, straining. They were or against wind. This lake was about seven, eight miles, and they had toured from evening, let's say eight o'clock, let's put it summertime, eight, eight o'clock, and when he comes on the fourth watch, that's between three and six a.m., okay? So they had been out there eight or nine hours going against this headwind, exhausted, worn out, okay? And had only gone a little bit over three miles. Eight furlong is one mile. And they had gone just a little, maybe three and a half miles. Only about halfway. After eight or nine hours. Now this was an exhausting, weary, tiring. And Jesus saw them strain. Okay? And he saw them. And about the fourth watch, this is the darkest time of the night. Have you ever worked midnights? I, I, I think that the demon got together in hell one day and said, you know, we have never tried the third shift. Let's sit up the third shift. I mean, it's awful. I worked at the Heron Hospital one time at, on, the, on the midnight shift. And I worked at North University. I said, I got my degree from SIU. I got my education at the North University. Now, and boy, just at daybreak, four or five, it was, that was the hardest time. You would throw water in your face. And back then working in the hospital, our third shift bonus was leftover day food from the hospital. <laughs> now, <laughs> that, and by the way, I was so ignorant, I like it. Uh, <laughs> it was the, 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 that jello. We don't have a bounce. You can play basketball in it. It never been. It, it really, the jello never been. It never been. And what they couldn't uh, force down people during the day, they gave it to us at midnight shift as a bonus. 
But at 4 or 5 o'clock, I would eat it. I ate too much jello, I was red. I shot my look red on the inside, trying to stay away. It's the darkest night. Darkest time. And Jesus waited until the darkest time. Genesis said the earth was dark and without form. And God said, I'm going to make something beautiful out of nothing. I'm going to take darkness and make something beautiful and something good. The Passover. Putting the blood on the doorpost. When? When did the angel pass over? Midnight. The exodus happened at midnight. Not at noon. But at midnight. Paul and Silas prayed and got out of jail when? At midnight. See my God is attracted to me. Midnight. See my in your darkest hour. He likes to show up. When Jesus was crucified, and as he died, what happened? Darkness came over the whole land. At the darkest time, what appeared in human eyes, God was doing his best work in redeeming mankind. Sometimes if you think it's the darkness, hang on. <laughs> You're on the brink of a miracle. Sometimes God has to, he's at the beginning of the road. But sometimes God has to let us get to the end of the road before we'll let go and grab on to him. You see. I just found that interesting that it was at the fourth watch. The wind was against them and he came to them walking on the sea. Now, he meant to pass by them. Number one, he was walking faster than they were rowing. If you can pass up a boat, you're going faster than, than the boat. So this guy's not making much gain. Anyway, now, the next verse. But when they saw him walking on the sea, Jesus saw them, and then he came to them. Why don't you nudge somebody next to you and say, he's on the way. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's on the way. He saw us, and he's coming. I believe he's on the way. I, I believe God is on the way in your storm, in your situation. Okay, now. And they cried out and they thought it was a ghost. For they saw him, when they saw him, how old, and were terrified. Now, no place in the record does it say he, they were terrified of the storm. No place. You never get a hint that they were afraid of the storm. But when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they became terrified. What? Number one, if I'm afraid of the bully, and this bully has bullied me around, and this young boy comes over and beats up the bully, okay? Now who I'm more afraid of? Him. If he's stronger than this guy, and I'm afraid of this guy, and this guy beats up that guy, I'm more afraid of him now. When you understand that Jesus really is God, that he is all powerful, that he can speak, and the wind and the waves will lie down, that tornado, let's say it, an act of nature, okay? Somebody says that God caused storm, and somebody says the devil caused storm. Which is it? 
Well, let's take a minute and look at two things. First of all, Noah, I mean Jonah, got into a storm because he disobeyed, right? Daniel got into the lion's den because he obeyed God. These disciples obeyed God and ended up in the storm. Now, Jonah said, this storm is because I disobeyed God. And he said, throw me overboard and this thing will calm down. Well, is a storm because you disobeyed God? No, not necessarily. The disciples did everything that was right and ended up in the storm. Well, is a storm because God is punishing you? No. Daniel obeyed, and Satan put him in the storm. The key is, I don't obey to keep storms from happening in my life. I don't obey thinking that will guarantee me a storm-free life. Why do I obey God? To keep me safe, to keep my family safe, to keep a job, to keep God happy? No. I obey God because He's God. That's why I obey God. I don't use God in order to get stuff. I don't say, if I go to church and if I do right and if I obey God, then storms won't happen to me. You see, you don't want God, you want safety. You don't want God, you want happiness. You don't want God, you want peace. And so the first thing I learned about that storm, these guys did exactly what God told them to do, and they ended up in a storm. Sometimes it rains on the just, it rains on the unjust, and sometimes it just rains. In place of us always trying to figure out who caused it, how am I going to embrace God in it? How am I going to experience God in the middle of this thing and learn from it because God is up to something in my life. God is in the middle of my life. God is working with me. He's more interested in my character than he is in my comfort. But the Holy Spirit lives in me. God is with me. He's working in my life. He's moving in my life. And whatever that, that might be, See, I might know that Hades comment is going to come by. I can tell you when Hades comment is going to come by me. But I didn't cause Hades comment to come by. Because God knows what's going to happen doesn't mean that he's going to call, that he's the cause of it. But don't spend your time trying to figure out, people are always asking me, do you think God is punishing me because of this thing or that thing? I said, that that's, that's really not the issue. The issue is, are you going to embrace God in the middle of this thing? Are you going to see Him as the one that we just sung about? The, the name of that all name. The one that I want to see. The, the thing that means the most to me. For me to live in Christ. He is the sum total of my existence. Not the benefits or not all that stuff, but God in himself. But they spoke to them and he said, take ye, it is I. When he said, it is I, the actual translation of, of this is, is he said, I am. Remember when Moses was in the bush and the voice came out and said, what is your name? Who I'm going to tell him who sent me? He said, I am. Not I was, now I will be, I am, I am everything that you need right now and tomorrow and yesterday or any other time. He said, take heart, it is I, don't be afraid. It's I am here now. I'm everything that you, that you want, everything that you need. Take heed, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, let's, let's uh, 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 move on down. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, 
Take heart. Don't be afraid. Have courage. I am. Do not be afraid. 51. And he got into the boat with them. Uh, John's version of this, they were glad when he got into the boat with them. I bet they were. <laughs> I bet that was the understatement of the year. They were glad and willing for him to get in the boat with them. Do you want him in your boat? See, that's not a problem. I don't think there's not anybody here that would say, no, I prefer Jesus to stay out of my boat. I think by now we all got sense enough to know we need him in our boat. But that's not the question. The question is, do I want to get in control of my boat? God is my co-pilot. That's the trouble, honey. That's the trouble. He doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He wants to be the pilot. The, the gospel isn't good advice. The gospel is good news. Not good advice. The good news is, without me, you can do nothing. And you don't need a life gap. I pray, devil, I pray to God, get me out of this pit that I have fallen in. The devil dug a pit and I fell in it. Get me out. And as soon as he gets me out, I ask for another uh, 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 a show. Barbara brought home a beautiful dress the other day. Beautiful dress. Got it from when Jacques uh, uh, Pinay was in business over there at Macy Pitt. And brought it home and I said, now Barbara, we talked about this. It's our budget. And you promised. I know. I know. But the devil just made me do it. What do you mean the devil made me do it? I got this dress. I looked in the mirror. And I said, no. We talked it over. I said, get me behind me, Satan. And he did. And he said, Barbara, it looks good from back here to the <laughs> We don't want to surrender. We want him in our boat to calm things down. But we don't want him to be boss of our life. You know what it means when you said I make Jesus Lord of my life? We don't use the word Lord much. Okay? I mean, we, we don't have it. Put the word boss in there. If I go down to get a job at <coughs> McDonald's or someplace, and they say, you got to wear this little brown shirt and this little bitty bow tie. you got to wear the uniform in the army or whatever it is. And I said, I don't want to wear that shirt. I don't want to wear that bow tie. I don't want to wear that uniform. Okay, that's fine. But you can't work at McDonald's. That's the deal. And if you go into McDonald's and they say, you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean, uh, I want you to wash that something. I don't want to wash it. Don't feel like it. It's been worse. It looks good enough to me. It's not really dirty. They say, fine. You don't have to wash it. But don't forget to leave that shirt uh, on your way out. That's what it is when I'm making the Lord of my life. Watch wherever you eat, watch wherever you drink. Do all to the glory of God. Amen. God, it is what you want me to do. Making boss of our life. And in the storm, I think we need to see that he really is bigger than the storm. And we all like that. But because he is bigger than, than the storm, because he is God, not only do I embrace him to get into my boat, I say, will you drive the boat? I want you to have control 
Now, if you're taking notes, I want you to remember, we're going to go 52. I want you to remember of this. Let's do this on 52. For they did not understand about the loaves. Now mark that down. He fed the 5,000. And then about verse 54, 55, when they got to the other side, everywhere that Jesus went, anybody that touched him got healed. A miracle of feeding the 5,000. The miracle that if anybody touched him, they were healed. In the middle of those bookends of those two miracles, he put this stone. Why? Maybe he wanted them to see after the 5,000, hey, this is a good gift. I don't ever have to worry about eating again. He'll just give me all the food that I ever want. Hey, this is pretty good. I don't have to worry about being sick again. I don't have to worry about being hungry again. And over here, this other miracle. You know, this, this God is pretty good. But right in the middle of that, he puts this stone. Wherever they didn't go, for over eight hours, they battled this contrary wind and couldn't get to where they wanted to go. And they labored, and he saw them. He said, you're not out of my sight. He watched them, hour after hour. He said, I want them to get to the place of understanding that without me, you can't do it. I want them to become so totally dependent upon me in just the everyday life. The exhausting, draining, frustrated, I'm don't have purpose. I don't seem to be mounting anything. I don't seem to be going anywhere. I'm just working and working. I go to work, come home, make, get up, go to work, get a paycheck to buy food so I can be healthy, so I can go to work, so I can get a paycheck to buy food, so I can be healthy, to go to work, to get a paycheck, to buy food, so I can be healthy, to go to work. And I'm in this, you know, the wheel's turning, but the hamster died. You know, uh, lights on, but nobody's home. You know, just in the middle of that. And because they didn't understand the miracle of the Lord. And what was that? Trust me. Trust me. If I can do the miracle of the love, see, we got the head knowledge. Everyone out here, all of us got the head knowledge of what we sing about and what we preach about. Here we go, talking about the storms again. And he's the master of the storm. He's the Lord of the storm. We have heard him since children. But Monday, when I'm out there at work with that contrary coworker, with that opposing culture that works against me, that makes me feel like an old dinosaur, and more and more I just feel like I'm out of step. I'm just not with it. And when I get into that situation, can I transfer the truth that I learned here? Can I really apply what, what I've learned into my everyday, everyday life? See, it's not just knowing this. It's living. He said, you are living epistles. Peter said, you, you, you walk, you're living it every day. And because they did not understand about the law, they missed Jesus. They thought he was a ghost. Maybe in the dark of that night, 
I don't know what it was, and he was going to pass by because they, they didn't get it. They want a life jacket. And I'm not a life jacket that you use for this crisis. I'm the Lord and Savior that in your life every day. And this storm or that storm doesn't matter. I'm, I'm the one. You just want help out of this crisis. You just want help out of this storm. You, you, you just want me to take care of this situation. How many times do people come to church and say, would you pray that my wife would come back? She walked out and took the kids. And they start coming to church all the time. Would you pray for my husband? He drinks and, and he comes in and he gambles up our paycheck or he does this or he does that. Well, you know, I understand that. We all came to him out of a need. To the hungry, he was bread. To the thirsty, he was water. To the lost, he was the guide. I understand that. But then we got to get past that. He's more than, because if the wife doesn't come back home, if the husband doesn't quit drinking, if you don't get the job that you've been praying for, what happens? They quit coming to church. They give up. It didn't work. You, you see, they wanted a life jacket. He wants in your boat. He wants control of you. It's not the storm. It's not the issue. It's he is the storm. Now let's read verse 53. And oh, we got four or five minutes. Let's go. <laughs> when they had crossed over. Now if you go back to the first verse, Jesus said, Let's go to the other side. Where were they going? To the other side. That's settled. He said, go to 2 Corinthians. Now mark this one down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Write that down. Since we have the same spirit of faith. Ever have people say, I need more faith? What did the disciples pray? Increase our faith. Here we go. Now, now, this is worth the hill trip. If we have the same spirit of faith according to what it had been written, I believe, and so I speak, we also believe, so we also speak. When Jesus got him in that boat, he says, it is I. He maximized himself. He didn't talk about the storm. He didn't say, well, it's a bad storm. He said, look at me. Keep your eyes on me, not the storm. We keep our eyes on the mountain, how big the mountain is. Not how big the way we grew. He said, look at me. Think about me. We pray the promise. I mean the problem, not the promise. Listen to us when we pray. The Lord help us. It sounds like if I can pray and convince God that I'm worse off than you, he'll answer me first. And by the way, he doesn't need information. When he says, Adam, where art thou? He knew where Adam was. Adam didn't know where he was. Spiritually. So God doesn't need you to tell me that I broke my ankle. He knew it before you did. We need to pray the promise. Find a scripture. I'm the Lord God that heals. Pray that over my ankle. Don't just pray about my ankle. They got to the other side. Why? Jesus said we're going to the other side. And the storm, whatever is going on in your life, isn't bigger than God's power in your life. Whatever is happening in your life is not bigger than God's plan for your life. Trust him. 
If I can feed the 5,000, I can take care of this little boat in a, in a big storm. But they didn't get it back then, they, so they couldn't apply it. I want us to get out here tomorrow, and I want us to live and to apply in the reality that God is the Lord of my life, and a storm or whatever happened is not going to keep him from fulfilling his destiny and his plan and his purpose for my life. Only I can get in the way, but a storm will keep me from it. They went to the other side because he said that they're going to the other side as it is written. I believe, and that's what I pray. I pray the promise, not the problem. Whatever situation you're in right now, you find a scripture, you find a verse, you find something that God has said about that. Are you lonely? He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake you. Focus on that. And he said that they got to the other side because he said they were going to the other side. Now, who you, are you holding on to? Who are you trusting? Would you invite him not only into your boat, come into my heart, but Lord, I surrender. I want you to drive. I want you to be control of my life. And that's hard. Is to, just to say, I want you to be in control of my life. So next May, when I see that black funnel, when I see that shed go selling, when we run back and see that tree fall through that roof, because there'll be another May, there'll be another storm. But I know this. God is faithful. And I can trust him. He knows what he's doing. When he said, boy, he's getting that boat. My job is to obey him. His job is to get me to the other side. And I promise you this. God will get you to where you and God are to go. When he has a plan and a purpose and God will get you to the other side to the other side of grief to the other side of loneliness he will get you to where he wants you to go as we yield to him Father we thank you in Jesus name as we come to this time Lord in this place that Lord that you are God all powerful holy the great I am, all that I'm ever going to need yesterday, today, or tomorrow. And Lord, help me to not only to invite you into my boat, but to let you have control of my boat. And to know that you're leading and you're taking me and you're working in my life in ways that I, I could never understand. Help us, Lord, to transfer truth into our life. Help us, Lord, this week. We'll, we'll need your help to not only believe it in my head, but to get it into my heart and that my every existence is in the, in the safety and the security that you see me and you're coming to me to rescue me. And this morning, if you don't know this Jesus, not for just what he can do for you, just not for meeting a need that you might have right now, but I just want to know you. Paul said, if I might come just to know him and to experience him and to embrace him. There's no other name under heaven whereby man may be saved. Jesus said, come unto me, follow me, not church, not doctrine, not what somebody else said about me, but I believe you can experience him this morning. If you just look to him, embrace him, invite him into your life. In the name of Jesus.
Amen and amen. Ladies, if you come and say thank you so much, so much. And if there's a prayer need that you would like, I 